It's uh, Benjamin Douglas Ray with another edition of Sustainable Cannabis TV. Uh, I'm here with Michael Patterson. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Benjamin. Thanks for having me on today. Yeah, you bet. Uh, this show is brought to you by BuzzFeed, uh, LinkedIn for Leaders Online, and 8 Saints Brand. So, Michael, you are the CEO of U.S. Cannabis, and there's a lot of other words behind it. And I was going to introduce you, but you've got so many titles, so many accomplishments that would take up the whole show. So I'll <laughs> let you talk about, you know, what your background is, what you're doing right now and how you got to this place in the industry. Sure. So thanks for having me on. And, and people who are watching on video, I apologize for my delay. Um, it's AT&T Internet and it is what it is. So I apologize. Yeah, but anyway, live, uh, so. Yeah, that's, it's that's live. Right. So so uh, hopefully you can still hear me, but uh, I'm a lifetime lifetime healthcare executive. I started out, um, I've been doing this 27 years in healthcare. Um, I'm a licensed occupational therapist and nursing home administrator. Um, I've run nursing home chain, uh, for, uh, was up and down the East Coast. We had 20 facilities in four states. Hmm. We did about 230 million in total revenue per year. And um, we got sued all the time. So I learned a lot about compliance. I learned a lot about regulation. I learned a lot about stress. Um, we had 2,500 employees and we had 2,500 wow. patients. So I come from a very litigious and regulated background. And then uh, after that, I moved in working to a, a, a capital company called Strategica Capital out of Miami. And I was brought in to handle all of their healthcare investments. So we were managing a home health company as well as we started a pharmacy division and a lab division. So I was in charge of running, running both of those. And um, I learned a lot about how billion dollar deals are done. I uh, really learned about how, uh, how, how to do a deal and how to work with people. And the number one thing I learned is you want to work with people who you trust and who, people who are honorable, because at, when you get to those types of deals, it, if they blow up in your face, it can really impact not just you, but people around you and employees and so forth and so on. But um, got into cannabis in uh, 2013. I've always been a closet smoker um, in the healthcare business that you can't really do that. So nobody really knew. And I moved into, I saw a lot of the issues around cannabis use, uh, specifically in the nursing home business. Um, if you're unaware, uh, nursing home patients typically are not allowed to use cannabis, even though it's legal in a certain states. Because so not even, not edibles, not, nothing. The no. challenge is, is nursing homes are pay, are reimbursed by Medicare and mm -hmm. Medicare is a federal program. And since cannabis is illegal federally, then you have to sign a waiver in your Medicare packet to receive money to say you're not going to do anything that's against federal law. So mm -hmm. a lot of nursing homes hide behind that and they don't offer the medication to patients, even though uh, they have it prescribed for a physician in their state. So it's still a really big problem. And that's something that I'm trying to work with people within the industry who are still there to try to resolve that. But um, I, I saw a lot of I saw the effects of opiates on a, a granular level, and yeah. I sp specifically saw it with senior citizens. And if if anybody on who's watching or is listening to this, if you've ever seen a senior citizen who's addicted to opiates, it's it has to be probably the, one of the saddest things you'll ever see. And wow. so I felt as if somebody needed to stand up primarily for senior citizens and try to move this forward. And so um, when U.S., when the Florida started to look at legalization in 2014 for cannabis, I said, you know, it's now or never. And it, I, I finally got to the point I was more scared of never trying than actually moving, uh, to, than actually uh, failing. And that's when I was ready to move forward. And so I uh, started in 2014 with U.S. Canvas Pharmaceutical Research and Development. We started with consulting with Indian tribes, believe it or not, because people mm. may not remember this in 2014, uh, the U.S. government said that Indian tribes could grow cannabis on their, their lands. Um, but a lot of the Indian tribes uh, did not trust the American government, as you can imagine. Um, there's yeah. a long history of, of, of distrust. So anyway, that has evolved throughout the years. We do a lot of consulting with venture capital firms. A lot of these mergers and acquisitions you're hearing right now, we were made aware of those through our, you know, through our advisement months ago. So it's exciting to just kind of understand what's going on before it hits the hits the airwaves, so to speak. And then we've evolved into working all over the planet now. So we have a joint venture with a company called MGMC Pharma Group, which is based out of the Seychelles. If you're unfamiliar, the Seychelles are um, just east of Africa. And mm. so we currently have six licenses in Africa with our primary license being in Lesotho, which is the picture that you see behind me. 
um, is the plants that are there. That's actually in Lesotho, or they pronounce it Lesotho. If you're unfamiliar where that is in Africa, it's the little country inside of South Africa. Okay. So they have been legal now since 2017, and we're currently shipping product through our GAP facility, which is Good Agricultural Practices. It's European Union certified. That is a standard for international um, shipment of cannabis. So we're shipping to Australia right now, and we're also shipping into Europe. And so our goal there is to build up the supply so when America goes legal, we can start supplying high quality, low cost crude and other materials, THC and CBD into America, because our concern when America goes legal, there's not going to be enough domestic production. And that means that prices could go through the roof if there's not enough supply. Hmm. Wow. I mean, that's that's amazing stuff you're working on. So where we are today, what is the future then uh, of the industry? Because, you know, we all talk about growth. We talk about where it's going and it's kind of gray and gray and green. As we know. <laughs> gray and what, murky. What, right. What, what's your prediction, really? Or what are you seeing as the future, really, of this industry as an industry? Um, I think you're going to see a lot more consolidation. Um, one of the challenges here in America is every state is like a different country when it comes to cannabis. So uh, what we do in Florida is so different than what goes on in Oklahoma, which goes on in California or in Colorado. So I think you're going to see a, uh, a, a system where you're going to see more um, consolidation. Um, and that goes from the federal level. So when the federal level this year, we expect them to address decriminalization of cannabis. So remember, if you're listening, decriminalization is not legalization. All that means is if you're caught on federal grounds with a little bit of cannabis, you don't go to jail. You'll mm -hmm. probably get a fine. But that's important because we're locking up a lot of brown and black people. And if you look at the data, the same amount of white people use cannabis as black and brown people. And so we need to make sure we, we decriminalize. And then the next level we see is uh, what we call is the Safe Banking Act or SAFE Act, where banks can start coming in and start working with the industry. And so we see that as a catalyst to help. And then internationally, what we're starting to see is more countries get into the space. Um, the challenge in internationally is it takes about two to three years for a country to get off the ground, meaning create the law, have the regulation, have companies come in, grow product, and then ship it out. And so the Sutu is a perfect example of that. They started in 2017, and we were luckily the first company ever to get legal product out of the Sutu um, through the international uh, trade. And so it took, and that happened in 2020. So it took three years to get that out. But what we're seeing is more um, countries legalizing and the stigma is starting to decline, specifically in Europe. Everybody's really excited about Europe, but, but our, it, it, we have to keep Europe in perspective. 90% uh, of all legal sales in the world are in America, even mm. though it's illegal. However, last year, um, Europe did 480 million in total sales. And the year before, they did 250 million. So they're almost doubling and we see potentially tripling every year. And the one of the reasons that Europe is so advantageous is because most of the cannabis is approved through socialized medicine. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who's dealt in the nursing home business and, and healthcare in the United States, our payer source, meaning Medicare, once you have a payer source, your valuations go up dramatically. Also, a third part that I see in the industry is you're going to start to see this bifurcation between recreational cannabis and medical cannabis. And I think mm -hmm. if, you, if, if people who saw the GW pharmaceutical deal that went through last week where they were sold for $7.2 billion, that's the medical pharmaceutical model. Um, so we're going to start to see that bifurcation. And I think um, the, the main thing we see over the next couple of years is you're going to start to see stockpiles of a product coming. And that's what we need, uh, uh, not just for America, but the world, because we have to bring to bring this medication to the masses. We have to get the price down. And that's what we're definitely working on. Wow. A lot of stuff. You know, I got a question about Africa. So how did you get involved in that or, or you know, what steps did you take being here? Obviously, you're, you're from the States. Um, How did you get interested in, in uh, Africa? That is a great question. And so uh, my short answer is LinkedIn, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. So based on my, uh, uh, my, my oh, I'm reading Vera Toomey's text. I know Vera. <laughs> Hi, Vera. Thanks for watching. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, everyone. That's great. Yeah. So uh, I got involved because I went to the first ever, I was a judge at the first ever World CBD Awards in Barcelona in 2019. So mm -hmm. I started speaking overseas in 2019. 
Um, I spoke in England as well as uh, uh, Spain and um, where else did I go? I went to Ireland. Um, so I've, I've been a lot of different places. And so one of the, the gentlemen that I met there called me a few months later and he says, hey, I need you to help me with a cannabis deal in Africa. And I'm mm, like, okay, okay like, what is that about? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, right. So we got on the phone and it was great because this, the, the company that we're dealing with now, MGMC Pharma Group, um, they, we had a great call and they said, look, we have the licenses in these, these countries in Africa, but we don't have the connections in, this, in the industry for sales. You know, mm -hmm. Can you help us? And so we started having conversations and it seemed to be a very good fit because everybody was bringing something different to the table, meaning I didn't have to deal with all the rules and laws in Africa because I admit I didn't know much about that. And so we, uh, it, it worked out to where I was going to handle from the sales side and then bringing in the technology into Africa from North America, Canada, as well as the United States to create a North American style uh, cultivation and processing facilities. But it just happens to be in Africa because one of the challenges in dealing with Africa is trust. A lot of mm -hmm. people from America and North America don't understand African businesses. I didn't, but we have to develop that trust. And so that's, that's how it started. And so last year was our proof of concept, which I tell people where we had to get the operation up and running. Um, as a side note, we, the facility we're in actually was built and operated by Canopy Growth. So mm -hmm. they pulled out in April of 2020, and then we came in in September of 2020. So we were able to take it over. So last year was proof of concept, and now we're moving forward into um, Europe right now. We're working on a deal with one of the governments there to do a long-term supply contract of CBD and THC oil. And so we'll have offices in Italy as well as Austria and Luxembourg. And then we're looking for expansion here back into the States because even in Africa, they realize the U.S. market is going to be the pivotal market. And so we are working now to be able to develop that supply. So when America is ready, we can definitely move it back in. But I will tell you, Benjamin, one of the hardest things and, and the best things, I guess it's good and bad, is I'm the only American on the team. <laughs> so yeah. it's a very unique situation because when I talk to people in the United States about cannabis and said, yeah, we're doing most of our stuff overseas, they kind of looked at me like we have three heads. And so <laughs> one of the challenges coming into federal legalization is it doesn't seem like anybody from America is thinking back, thinking past the first day we go legal. Um, mm -hmm. We really need to start thinking about the infrastructure and how to service these markets from around the world. And so also from the federal regulation in the United States, whatever we decide on the rules is what the world is going to accept and, and, and follow. So we really need to think this through because I don't want to be sitting here when we go legal and so many people having problems like we're having in the hemp industry due to poor regulation. You know, that's a, that's a good point. Let's, let's get into that a little bit about federal legalization. You know, I, I've got a lot of uh, friends in the business who don't want it to go federal because once it becomes, uh, you know, uh, off of a schedule one narcotic, I think there, there are a lot of other regulations that come into it, like the FDA and a lot of things. So they're like, we don't, we don't want to be regulated even more. Just let me uh, regulate, do it in my state or joint ventures or whatever it is where, where it is legal. So I know there's controversy within and outside of the industry about federal legalization. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, and I think what we're going to see is you're going to see that bifurcation. You're going to see the pharmaceutical side where it's federally legal from a medical, and then mm -hmm. you're going to have the recreational cannabis side. And so typically what I find is people who are not from a regulated environment do not want regulation. People like me who are used to tons of regulation, for example, the nursing home industry is um, the most regulated and litigious in America. So mm -hmm. no matter what type of regulation you throw at me, it's not going to bother me because mm -hmm. what we've learned is we have learned that the more regulation, you limit the amount of, of competitors. And mm -hmm. for us, that's good and bad. But I think a lot of people, they're coming from their base of knowledge. And as you know, Benjamin, when you come into cannabis, everybody comes from a different place professionally and personally. And so we really have to, for companies to, to really thrive, you have to uh, understand to get a baseline of knowledge within your corporation and then try to move forward collectively. But I think it's the regulation is something that people need to understand in order for America to move forward and the world to move forward. We have to have strong regulation because one of the things we're dealing with right now 
is international trade problems. We're mm -hmm. having situations, we're dealing with clients who are shipping pro product from Colombia to Germany, or I'm shipping product, for a, T a CBD product from America to Lesotho, and get just getting your product through customs or getting approved to see shipped to customs could take months. Right. So these systems have to work for America to move forward and the world to move forward. So I understand people don't like regulation, but in order that for this industry to be able to bring in the type of money and investment that we need to take off and to create millions of jobs here in the United States, we have to have that clear regulation. You know, just talking about it the other day uh, with Tim about interstate commerce, you know, if you have states that are connected, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to conduct business. And that is putting up walls around every single state. And as you say, limiting jobs, limiting commerce, limiting so much. And that's just a microcosm of what the world is like. So I, I totally agree with you that we need to open up, but to open up, you need to be tighter with the regulations. You know, it's like it's like the, one of those sayings that discipline equals freedom. And it's kind of the same is that, you know, when, when we were going through our, our uh, you know, licensing, it was really like once you know what to do, you can play the game. You know, mm -hmm. if it's gray, you don't know what to do. If you have messy laws, if you have different laws in each state, different municipalities, different uh, countries, it's incredibly hard to do business, you know, so. I agree with you. Regulation is better, uh, but we have to do it right so that we don't we don't uh, end up with a lot of problems like, as you're saying, in the hemp industry now. Well, if I can add to that is that yeah. one of the things that we all need to focus on in America is once it goes legal here, all those fake borders are going to fall. And what that means is, is that you have to really get your efficiencies and your cannabis grow dialed in because if you're in Colorado and your cost per gram is a dollar 50 or $2 a gram and you want to sell to Oklahoma, well, or you want to get a contract with Amazon to be able to produce this product, you have to figure that out because now your customers can go online and they can order whatever they want. So mm -hmm. what I see is the larger companies are going to be supplying the quote Amazon accounts. And then we're going to have different different aspects of the business. We're going to have a national wholesale distribution uh, business where people can get in and move this around the country. And then we're going to have national uh wholesaler for flour and wholesaler for oil. And then you're going to have pharmaceutical companies that companies can actually apply, uh, provide. And then one of the areas that we want to focus on is providing cannabis products for uh, institutional pharmacies that deal with nursing homes and hospitals and things like that, because we understand those regulations. And what I've learned in this space is if I can approach companies who are in the pharmaceutical space and I know the pharmaceutical space and I can uh, expose them to the cannabis space saying, yeah, I understand what your concerns are, but we already have that covered based on X, Y, and Z. They're more interested in potentially working with you because they, they want to deal with people that understand their side of the, of their point of view. Mm -hmm. And then it's the ability to connect the dots and to break a complicated topic down of cannabis down to where people, even in pharmaceutical can understand what it is and what it is not. Right. Well, when do you think that's going to happen? That's the, That's, <laughs> That's the billion dollar question. Right. So this year, what we expect is we expect decriminalization to go through. We expect the Safe Banking Act to pass in some way, shape or form. And um, I'm predicting that the cannabis will be descheduled to something other than Schedule 2 this year. Because if you listen to what Biden has said in the past, he said he's not for legalizing recreational but he is interested in legalizing for medical and he wants to have more research. So what we expect is when they change to a schedule two, three, four or five, we expect a lot of the pharmaceutical companies are going to start dipping their toe in. And a lot of people are like, Oh, big farmers coming in and the world's going to end. And that's not fair. But, what big pharma does bring is money for research. And that's one of the projects we're working on in Florida. We're working on creating the largest hemp and cannabis research zone in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's called the star zone, the S T A R, which stands for the space and treasure coast agricultural research zone. It will be based one hour North of West Palm beach, Florida. And the goal is, is to facilitate innovation and bring in American companies through federal grant money, which we expect to come this year and next year to start studying cannabis and hemp and really starting to figure out how do we scale up a lot of these opportunities 
for hemp growers and industrial hemp and biofuels, clean energy, all the things that the Biden administration talks about. We really need a place that we can all come together and exchange ideas. And our entire program has been based off the, the study and the success of Research Triangle Park, which is outside of Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. And if the listeners and viewers are unfamiliar with what they call RTP is it's the has the most uh, concentration of PhDs in America and they mm. generate billions in total revenue and millions in tax revenue. It started as a public private partnership in the 70s and then now it's total private generating uh, tons of money and tons of research. And so we have taken that research triangle park model and looking to emulate that through Florida to where we can bring in jobs and bring in uh, bring in companies from overseas to do research. We're already looking to partner with many universities in Florida as well as other universities in America. Uh, and we're looking to create um, the, the Mecca for where people will come for the next 20, 30, 40 years into cannabis to do R and D. And that's great. That's, I mean, that, that is what's needed. You know, I've got a question back to the federal legalization for the viewers and listeners who don't, uh, don't know. And, and I don't know this myself. So when we would go federal, what happens if a state has still not voted to have marijuana? What happens then? Then it's a great question. It goes back to what happened in alcohol prohibition. So I grew up in a state, uh, North Carolina. If you can tell by the accent, I'm not from Alabama. A lot of people <laughs> say, you from Alabama? <laughs> no, I'm not from Alabama. I got nothing against Alabama. But um, so what when I was growing up, we had it to where we had uh, blue counties or the, they call them blue laws and blue laws were counties that didn't allow alcohol to be purchased. However, you could possess the alcohol and you could not be arrested. So what we expect is to see the same thing with cannabis. If I live, it, it, my parents live in North Carolina and when we go federally legal, they could be able to receive their cannabis in the mail, but they're not going to be able to go to a store and buy it. So that's what we typically expect. Um, you will have states that are going to be outliers like Idaho. I don't know if you've recently seen that Idaho is trying to pass a constitutional amendment to yeah. never make cannabis legal. Yeah. So you will have those outliers, but what will happen in my opinion is, is when the, if medical cannabis does go legal across the country, um, you're going to have a lot of problems in states that do not allow it because Medicare will now approve it and people can get their medication with uh, with the Medicare and Medicare will, will be able to, uh, you'll be able to order it or get it through a pharmacy. So it's going to create a lot of challenges for the CVSs and the Walgreens of the world because these patients will have to either go out of state or they'll have to order it online to be able to get their medication. Well, challenges that we need to work through ahead of time, as you say. So, you know, I get a lot of questions about how to get in the industry. You know, where do you start? And with your global experience and all the different ancillary things you're working on, what are you, what are you seeing in the space? Uh, you know, and I've also heard from people, oh, it's already passed. You know, it's I've missed the boat, whatever it is. As we know, it's growing. What are the opportunities and what are you seeing for someone who wants to get into the space? Well, my answer to that question is when people say, you know, oh, I missed the boat, then my answer is then you just you're you're making up excuses not to get involved mm -hmm. um, because we're we haven't even literally we haven't even started. I mean, think about it. We're still in prohibition. Yeah. <laughs> so right. let's put things right. in perspective. Yeah. So. So I think what 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 I, I tell people is you need to do your homework. I encourage everybody to follow me on LinkedIn. I'm one of the most followed people in the world uh, on cannabis. It's uh, Michael Patterson, U.S. Cannabis Pharmaceutical Research and Development. Also, I encourage you to to look at the the lot of uh, schools are starting to have these um, certification classes. I'm not advocating that people go spend thousands of dollars if they don't want to, but there is a lot of value in those classes because one of the things that I've found in the cannabis space is people applying for jobs are very lazy. So I, I'm very familiar with a lot of HR companies and I have a lot of friends who have cannabis businesses and they said they would have 500 applicants for a job and then 
nobody, you know, just to have a cover page on a resume, there would probably be maybe five out of a thousand. Then they get mm -hmm. them into an interview and nobody even knows anything about the company. They don't know anything about the state law, if it's a state, state operation. So oh. I encourage people to do their homework and start studying this. Uh, I do a lot of consulting and, and uh, education with universities because the universities are going to start moving into this because if you're unfamiliar, education is a business. And so cannabis is a great way to have new, a new a business stream, a revenue stream. And one of the companies or universities we work with is University of Maryland. They just opened up a new Masters of Cannabis Science and Therapeutics program. Wow. And they have 150 students graduating this May will be their inaugural uh, graduating class. So I did a, uh, a question and answer for them a couple months ago. And, and Benjamin, I asked every single student, what are you going to do with this degree? And not any, none of them had an answer. <laughs> they didn't know what they didn't know what they were going to do. So not right. a career path. Well, what they did is, and, and I want to preface that by saying that's expected and I'll explain why, but the bigger thing is, is they're going in the right direction. And that's what I tell people about cannabis is you don't need to know exactly where you're going. Just start moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. And on your journey, the journey will show you where you need to go. And that's what's happened with me. And nobody helped me when I started eight years ago and I had to work through trial and error. And so after working with the students at the University of Maryland, I was able to connect the dots for them. So let me give you a couple of examples. So you have uh, uh, most of those students that were, had advanced degrees. Some were physicians, PhDs, masters in science in uh, finance or MS in uh, political science. But mm -hmm. uh, I had one person who is a, uh, a public uh, has a master's in public health. And she said, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. And I said, well, if I were you, I would go back into public health and I would try to go run uh, a state marijuana program because now you understand public health, but you also understand cannabis. So you'd be a great candidate. And she got really excited. She's like, oh, that's great. Then I talked to a a doctor who's in the Virgin Islands, who's in the class, and she didn't know what to do. And I suggested that she goes to the government there and start being an advisor. And she said, that's great. One of my patients is the, the um, Secretary of Commerce for the Virgin Islands. So she's going to oh. go work through that. Yeah. And then another great guy, he had a master's in finance, and he thought he was going to do a grow or a processor when he got out. And I asked him point blank, I said, do you have any experience doing e any of those things? And he said, no, I don't. Yeah. So I told him, I said, my suggestion would be go back into finance and go through a recruiter. And that way they just put out your, your, your resume with your experience in finance and cannabis. And I think you will be gobbled up by financial firms. And he, he responded, that's great because you're right. Nobody has experience in finance with cannabis. And I validated that because all the calls I do with venture capital firms, very few actually understand the inner workings of this industry. So he was excited. And so since I've been doing this so long, I have the ability to see like a, what I say is a 30,000 foot view. And mm -hmm. it's just because of experience. And I've been, do, I've been doing it for so many years. And so if I can help others um, find their, their purpose or find their voice, so to speak, in this industry, I definitely like to do that. You know, the cool thing about what you were saying is those, those aren't typical paths that you think about if you want to get into the industry. It's like, well, I might, you know, go work as a bud tender. I might hire on it to grow, to learn about it. But this business is way more than that. And every single guest on here has had a different background, as you said, different place in life, different background, you know, a lot of those advanced degrees. And there, there are careers that are being created right now and that will continue to be created that, that we have no idea right now that they would exist. I mean, it's like putting, you know, two or three or four different industries together and moving in this direction. I mean, it's a it's a terribly exciting time, you know, just when I think about that, that this is really ground zero. We are still in prohibition and there's a world of opportunity out there. Oh, 100 percent. And so a lot of times I tell people is, again, we go back to direction, just just start moving forward. However, um, be open to different opportunities in the space. So mm -hmm. a, a lot of times I tell people is that the cannabis industry is unlike any other industry on the planet because it's new. And what I mean by that is if you look at the um, uh, situation in America over the last four or five years, as we've been very, um, we haven't been united about anything. Let's just say that. So one of the, the bright spots, and, and I used to talk when I started, I said cannabis will unite America and save humanity from itself. 
and people thought I was crazy. But but if you really look at it, 93 percent of Americans want medical cannabis legal based on a Quinnipiac study in 2019. And then up to 68 percent in the most recent studies want cannabis legal. So when you're looking at both of those, then it makes a lot of sense. And so when people come into the cannabis industry, it's very unique, Benjamin, because they are willing to listen and they're willing to learn. And mm -hmm. if if that doesn't sound earth shattering, imagine going into uh, if you're a nurse and you're you've been practicing for 10 years and you go work from you used to work in Miami and you're going to go work in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, everybody you're going to work with in Atlanta, they all came up from a similar background. They all went to nursing school. They all worked in a hospital or a nursing home or a doctor's office. And they typically are like, no, this is the way it needs to be done because I've done it this way for 10 years. Right. Well, in cannabis, if you have a brand new nurse who comes in, she's she or he or she is immediately willing to learn from somebody they don't know because it's something brand new. And I look at that as this is the reason why you can create amazing teams because the number one challenge that I had running a 2,500 uh, employee nursing home chain is getting everybody on the same page and getting them to learn something new because they were all set in their ways. So what I've seen in the cannabis space is, is there's so much opportunity if you're willing to learn and adapt within different, different teams and be able to interact with each other because the the cannabis success is going to be the ability to interact within other with other people. You know, I when, when you talk about that, I, I kind of get chills because I see innovation. You know, I think when when you have an industry and you have a lot of different people coming together and everything is wide open, that's where innovation happens, and that's what I'm super excited about because I hate I hate the status quo. I hate it when people right. say we've done it this way forever, so that's how we're always going to do it. Because to me, that just that that's hitting a brick wall. I mean, that's running into a brick wall if you're somebody who who wants to innovate. And so we don't have that here. You know, we don't have it because people don't have that experience yet. You can't say oh, I've been in this industry for sixty years and it just, it hasn't existed yet. And that's why it's such an amazing time to drive forward with innovation, collaboration, communication, cooperation. As I said a couple of days ago in this, and it's just an exciting time. Tons of opportunity, in my opinion. And if I can add to that, so I don't know if people follow astrology, if they do or they don't, it doesn't really matter. But if you look at astrology and look up the age of Aquarius and is is the age of enlightenment, and that started last month and it's supposed mm -hmm. to run years. And so in my opinion, the insurrection January 6th was the end of one phase of humanity. And then moving forward into January is the, is the opening of the age of enlightenment, which is the age of discovery. It's the age of innovation. It's the age of advancement, just like you said. And look at what's happening outside of cannabis. We're going to be having in the next couple months, Blue Origin, which is owned by Amazon. They're going to have the first private tourist uh, rockets going into space. Mm, so we've mm. been talking about this for probably, what, 100 years about having yeah. tourists in space, and that's going to happen. Starlink just came up through the planets have aligned, Michael Woods McCausland. Exactly. The planets yeah. have aligned. Right. And so right. we, are, we are starting a new trajectory to humanity, and I think he, uh, cannabis has a very big position to play in that because – think about the unity aspect and uniting behind this because I could talk to my my Republican and Democrat brethren I'm an independent but but talk to both of them to say we can create this together so it can benefit everybody along the way and mm -hmm. we can work together because I in my opinion I think people are tired of fighting with each other and the people yeah. who are drawn into cannabis all come from a to in my opinion and what I've seen and, and, and met, met thousands of people who want to come into the space is they're all drawn here by something bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we want to tap into is that ability to work together. Because if we've seen anything as Americans, look at what we did in World War II. I mean, we were fighting two battles on two different continents and we won them both. And the only way we did that is because we all believed in the cause and we mm -hmm. were all willing to sacrifice to move forward. What I'm trying to do is explain to America, specifically Washington, D.C., is that this is our opportunity to be great again, not in a in a political way, but in a Main Street way to where we can sit there and be amazing to create jobs and innovation. And and be honest, we need to get back our swagger as Americans. We need to come in and we need to sit there and start and start 
really driving this engine because right now everywhere around the world is driving this because America is taking a back seat. And so my job, I feel, is to really push out the um, the American ingenuity, innovation and yeah. abilities and the entrepreneurial spirit, because the main thing that I hear overseas, Benjamin, is when is people come up to me all the time when I'm over there and said, when are you, meaning America, going to get off your ass and legalize this? Because we cannot move forward until you do. Yeah. Well, we're seeing it uh, above us, you know, Canada and now Mexico. We're kind of getting squeezed. We've got to do something. You know, I mean, they're they're not going to be too happy with us if we're leading. You know, it's like get going, you know, get innovating. Well, they will because everybody, all roads lead back to America. We are a buyer's economy and I don't see that changing under cannabis, but we can't buy what we don't have. And that's where we need the global support. Ironically, China is not in this game. Because, and I think that's a good thing for now, because American right now does not trust Chinese products per se, at least medicine. And a lot of these products are going to come in, the, 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 the raw materials are going to come in from the equator countries in Africa and Latin America because the cost of production is low. But then you're going to see the pharmaceutical products starting coming in from Europe initially. And then a lot of those raw materials will be will be imported into America and be used at, and, and American companies will do finished product. And I compare this to the auto industry because the auto industry, a lot of the materials are made outside the country and then they're shipped in for for what they call final assembly in the United States. So I kind of see something similar like that as we move down this road towards legalization. And great stuff. Excellent. I'm sure we could talk about this for hours. Yes, um, I, I could talk about cannabis all day long. Oh uh, no, it's it's great, you know, and you're doing a great job with your podcast, getting the information out there, all the stuff that you're doing. It's really, uh, it's really good to see, and uh, congratulate you for that podcast, and look forward to all the episodes coming up. So, how can people reach you? What's the best way? And uh, what about some websites? And if they want to have a chat with you. Great. So uh, the best way to get a hold of me is through LinkedIn. And it's just Michael Patterson, U.S. Cannabis Pharmaceutical Research and Development. Um, I pretty much accept everybody. And uh, we get a lot of great feedback from our site. Our goal is to educate as much as possible. And then I would definitely encourage everybody to follow our um, to, to watch our podcast, which is on YouTube. And it's just you can put into YouTube search the Cannabis Report with Michael Patterson. Uh, my identical twin brother is the executive producer. And so he um, he's basically my alter ego. So he can we, we have a lot of good times. And our, our goal for the show, our goal for the show is uh, infotainment is to be able to give a little bit of great cannabis knowledge, but also have a lot of good fun. Um, so we've cut over 11 shows and we just finished a show with um, the executive producer of a new uh, streaming television show that will probably be on Discovery. Um, it's called High Valley Hemp. And so it should be coming out in a few months. And so they uh, spotlighted myself and others to be on the show. And then we're working through them and potentially others to follow me around the world later this year through Europe, Africa, Australia, and New Zealand to, to cut a show. And cause I told them, I said, look, we're going to have a great time. You need to get it on film. And they, yeah. they were like, this sounds yeah. great. And That's I was great. like, well, I'd watch that. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. So I, I want to bring that, that, that flavor and that excitement to television and really motivate millions of people to, to follow what we're doing. Because I think everybody in the industry right now is what I call the tip of the spear. And there's millions of people watching what we're doing and we have to push this forward. So when Benjamin, you and I become senior citizens, we need to make sure there's enough infrastructure there to make sure we can get that medicine that we need. That's right. Well, that's all great stuff to end up here. Tell us what you're working on this year. What are you most excited about coming up? I'm most excited about, it's hard to say most excited, but I'm, I'm excited about multiple things. But I think our operation in Africa, MGMC Pharma, we're looking to make some strategic acquisitions um, in multiple countries to where I feel that we will probably, um, our goal this year is to break $100 million in revenue. And to put that in perspective, last year we made $180,000, no, $200,000. And that's where the market can go on an international level to where we, I feel like it's our duty to do that because our goal in Africa is to have a social equity plan where we can pay local farmers to grow cannabis and that cannabis we can be converted into oil. And then we will grow pharmaceutical cannabis like behind me here on the, on the, on the uh, screen, we will grow that for pharmaceutical companies. But my, my biggest exciting thing, I guess if I had to pick 
was being able to grow that business uh, dramatically because that will bring a lot more opportunity to a lot of locals there in Africa and create an industry in which um, we can support the local economies in Africa rather than just come there and just use up all their natural resources. And, and also with that, we're currently working on a potential deal to um, help with um, disbursement of COVID vaccine throughout Africa. And that will be coming in a vaccine coming in from potentially Korea as well as um, Italy. So we're very excited about that. The world to know is cannabis is part of the uh, human economy and is, is part of the pharmaceutical economy and it's a part of things moving forward at a pharmaceutical level. And so we feel like we need to start changing the, the mindset of cannabis. And by bringing in life-saving COVID vaccine, one, we're helping the population, but two, we're hoping to decrease that stigma of cannabis as just being a recreational drug. Yeah, that's great. I mean, so much cool stuff you're working on. Excited to talk to you again, and, and, and I'll keep up with what you're doing. Benjamin, thanks so much for having me on, and everybody, thanks so much for watching. Yeah, you bet. E everyone on here will answer all of your questions on here. Uh, you can continue to add to the stream, and we'll answer questions, uh, put up resources here, whatever you guys need. So thanks, everyone, for joining. It's uh, been a great show.